Hello, I'm Kristen at Kentucky Reptile Zoo, and this is Jim. And we're going to be extracting from Western Diamondbacks today. And we thought it might be a nice idea, especially since we're all uh, locked down and no one can visit, to go over a lot of the more common questions that we get during extractions uh, here at the zoo. So, um, just a brief explanation of how the whole process works to get us started. So Jim will take out each snake. Uh, he will set it in the little box here. And he uses that to uh, get a hold of the snake. So on the, in the bottom of the box is a foam mat. And that just makes it soft enough so he's not going to hurt them when he pins them. And then uh, once he gets a hold of them, brings them up here to the funnel and allows them to bite onto it. And basically, the snake views the extraction procedure, the whole thing, as a predator encounter. So it is not physically harmful for the snake, but it is scary for them. So they think Jim wants to eat him or wants to eat them, and they are just trying to protect themselves by biting, which, which is a defense mechanism of most snakes to bite. Now, if you see Jim, uh, rubbing or looks like he's moving around his fingers on the top of the snake's head. He is basically following the contractions of the muscles around the glands that the snake itself is doing. So I know a lot of times it looks like he's squeezing the glands, but he's not actually doing that. He's simply following the motion of the muscles. The snake has three muscles around each gland and the snake squeezes those in order to inject venom. And he's just been doing it long enough. He can tell when the snakes are contracting those muscles. He follows it to kind of keep the gland in the open position for a little bit longer and get a little bit more venom. And that's why sometimes when he's doing it, his fingers move in a different way. Like sometimes it's a longer hold. Sometimes like that last one was kind of quick. That's because that's what the snake itself is doing. Uh, so this one is an albino. Uh, the venom is the same. It's just came out of one of the bloodlines we had from Texas. Kind of interesting looking. We have a couple, I think, in this right. So once we collect the venom, uh, we will take it and freeze it here. And then we also do a process here called lyophilization, which is basically freeze drying. If you've ever had like instant coffee crystals, it's made the same way. And that just makes the venom really stable so that it can be shipped safely uh, and stored for a long period of time while still maintaining all of its biological activity. Uh, there are some instances where we will filter or centrifuge the venom, but in general, we don't do that unless we're asked to by a client. Uh, but it is certainly something that can be done. I mean, we found as long as the snakes are healthy to begin with, there's not really very much excess material or cellular debris of any sort in the venom, as long as they're healthy when you extract from them. Uh, sometimes the snakes are really unhealthy or have some sort of infection that can end up in the venom, but if we know of anything like that going on with our animals, we don't extract from them. When Jim is picking up the snakes, He's putting his fingers in a very precise location. Uh, they are located directly behind the maxillary bone or the, the jaw bone of the snake. And it freaks us out sometimes when we see other people uh, on videos or, or online somewhere that have picked up the snake and allowed their fingers to come forward past that um, or underneath. The, the snake is capable of moving each fang independently. And so if your fingers are not in the exact right location, the snake can still potentially stab you with a fang and envenomate you. So uh, picking animals up like this or picking a venomous snake up like this is really only done for venom extraction and perhaps for a few medical procedures. We actually can do the vast majority of medical procedures using other techniques that don't require us to grab onto the snake. Um, there's not very many instances where there's a legitimate reason to do it other than venom extraction or perhaps some sort of medical thing. Um, it's not something that should be done just to hold the snake for, you know, fun to look at it or something like that because it is dangerous. The most dangerous thing about it is actually releasing the snake. So many times if people think they know what they're doing and they pick the snake up, when they go to release it, then they get themselves in trouble. So it's not something that we would ever suggest anybody do 
unless you've become a professional and are doing it uh, for work purposes. One other question that we're asked frequently is how often we extract from the snakes. And it's important to realize that the snakes do have venom at all times. So even after he is finished extracting from one, that snake still has venom. It does not give all of the venom that it has during the extraction. We're getting maybe about a third of the venom that's contained in the glands during the extraction. Uh, and so it still has venom. If it were to bite immediately after the extraction, it could still envenomate Jim and cause a problem. But because this is stressful on them, and there are some components that do take a little bit longer to uh, be produced, we give them at least a two-week break in between extractions. And that varies some by species, uh, depending on how well the snakes tolerate uh, the extraction process. So two weeks is the absolute shortest amount of time that we wait in between extractions. Some other species go three to four weeks in between extractions. general snake information. Oh, yeah, sure. Moving on to the next row. So some kind of general information, uh, really no matter where you live, uh, if you are in a place where there are native venomous snakes and you worry about them, uh, really the best advice we can give you is if you do see a snake while you're outside, stay away from it, leave it alone, don't bother it. All snakes prefer to be left alone if possible. So if you see one and you just let it be, the chances of you having a problem with the snake are very, very slim. If you want to make sure that they're not hanging out in your yard or around your house, the best thing that you can do is simply uh, try to make your yard unattractive for them. So keep your grass short and mow frequently. Make sure you don't have uh, low-lying plants that give snakes or their food cover. Make sure you don't have a wood pile or other debris in your yard that could be a nice place to hang out for them. Uh, the more kind of cleaned up and uh, less amount of vegetation there is, the more likely that even if the snake does come through, it'll just continue on and pass through instead of hanging out there indefinitely. Uh, Western diamondbacks are of course not native to here in Kentucky. Uh, they are found uh, kind of in a very large area of the uh, southwest uh, part of the United States. They have quite a large range but they're probably uh, most famous for being found in Texas, uh, kind of the iconic rattlesnake in the United States. And uh, when, when Jim has a chance here, we'll ask him to let us look at a rattle for a minute. When he has one that he feels comfortable showing us, then we'll, we'll take a look at that. But the rattlesnake rattle is a warning device. So if the snake is rattling his tail, that basically means that he is scared and he's trying to let you know that he's there so that you can leave him alone. And it's thought that the rattle um, was an adaptation for avoiding uh, large animals that may not notice the snake is there. So if they realize it's there, they can avoid the snake um, and the snake will not get stepped on, which is of course <laughs> a good thing for the snake. And there's actually many snakes, uh, even many non-venomous snakes will rattle their tails when they get scared. So water snakes, rat snakes, king snakes, all sorts of things will vibrate their tails. And even though there's not a rattle on those guys, if they're in a bunch of dry leaf litter or something, then they can still sound uh, quite similar to a rattlesnake. Sometimes people will think that you can tell the age of a snake by counting the number of buttons on the rattle. Uh, but that's not true. The snake gets a new button on its rattle every time it sheds its skin. So you cannot tell the age of the snake because the, um, first of all, they don't shed only once a year, so they can shed six or eight times a year maybe. And uh, you also can't know if the snake has broken off its rattle in the past. So sometimes if they're fighting with a predator or gets caught somewhere, then um, the rattle can break off. So this snake, um, here's a little bit closer view of his rattle. And each one of these segments is the thing that he gets when he sheds his skin. And it grows from the base outwards. So this is the youngest part of the rattle and this is the oldest part of the rattle. And you can see 
that they get smaller as they go towards the end. And I think the end of his is a little bit broken, but you can see that this interior part, this is actually part of the segment below. And as the snake shakes his rattle, those pieces knock against each other. And that's what makes the sound is when they're knocking against each other. All right, thanks. Of course, many times people also ask us, what is the point of doing this? Why are we extracting from the snakes to begin with? Um, and it isn't just for fun. Uh, we actually have, <laughs> are you having fun? <laughs> um, we actually have clients all over the world and it's closed. You could do a couple more. Uh, Primarily, the people that we provide venom to are researchers at a university or a pharmaceutical company who are doing some sort of biomedical research with the venom. So that may be anything from studying the snake's biology and learning just how the snake itself uh, uses its venom and how the venom varies from individual to individual. So we provide venom for that sort of thing sometimes. Uh, sometimes we provide venom that is used to study or develop treatments for different sorts of diseases or conditions. So uh, all sorts of things can be uh, looked at using snake venom. Um, much of what we know about how blood clots was actually originally uh, discovered using snake venom because the venom can interrupt the clotting process at different points. Um, snake venom is used in research on stroke, heart disease, uh, different sorts of cancers, uh, osteoporosis, I'm sure I'm forgetting a few things, pain control, and of course different species have venom that's used in different sorts of research because different snakes have different components in their venom. Oh yeah, <laughs> there actually is quite a bit of uh, antiviral research that's gone on, uh, particularly with some uh, cobra venoms. So there are a lot of potential uses, some of which might be a slightly more interesting to us at this exact moment in time. Uh, we do provide venom, sometimes it's used to make anti-venom as well, uh, particularly here in the U.S. And then uh, this venom is also used uh, to make the vaccine for dogs and horses that's available in the western U.S. So we probably do need to change that. So. so basically we don't let these vials get too full because when we do, they'll break in the freezer. <laughs> so that's what the venom looks like. And then I'm going to just switch out this file. Jim, do you want to take the vial? I'll put this stuff in. going to point out is if you watch the snake's behavior, uh, it's actually not very common for the snakes to strike at Jim during this process. Uh, sometimes they do, but it's not really very, very common. And you would think if snakes really wanted to bite him that they would at least try to occasionally, but usually that doesn't happen. Typically, the snakes, when they're uh, set into the box, will try to run away, or maybe they just kind of freeze because they don't know what's going on. And uh, they usually do not actually strike. And I, that's really just the nature of the snakes. They're not interested in trying to hurt us. And um, there's actually a really interesting paper that recently came out um, that was discussing the use of snake venom as a defense. and. Uh, mention the fact that there actually it may not be very useful as a defense because the pain is somewhat delayed. So kind of an interesting point. Obviously they do bite as a defense, but uh, the venom is really for the snake to get its food. So it would rather not be using the venom uh, on us if they can avoid it because it's important for them to be able to use it to capture their prey. Of course here at the zoo we provide them with food. So <laughs> They 
don't really have to worry about catching it for themselves. Yeah, actually, I think every one in this uh, particular uh, set of enclosures was born here at Kentucky Reptile Zoo. So these guys are a few years old. Um, I have to look at their cards to remember exactly how old they are, but um, all of these were born here and have um, lived here their whole life. I suppose the last thing actually I'll mention as we're getting close to the end of these is uh, a little bit about the, the drawers that we use. You can see some more behind me as well. And these are uh, professional grade uh, snake enclosures. Uh, they're made specifically for snakes. And they are not appropriate for every kind of snake, uh, but they do work really well for snakes that like to stay hidden most of the time. Uh, the rattlesnakes do. They if they're out moving around or doing that in order to find the things that they need. And inside each enclosure, uh, of course, they have water. And then they also have um, a heat panel that runs along uh, the back section of each enclosure. So that way they can thermoregulate as they need to. So they can be cooler uh, if they are towards the front and warmer if they're towards the back. And it gives them a nice gradient. And then each uh, system also has several perforated holes uh, in the top section, and that allows them to actually have light that enters in through those, and it's also, of course, for ventilation. And we found that some species of snakes, like these guys, for example, actually do really well and stay really healthy when they're kept in this sort of enclosure. Again, they're not great for every kind of snake. Um, but for these guys, they do uh, really well. And it really lowers their stress. You know, keep in mind that this thing that we're doing for them is an extremely stressful event for the snake. Even though it doesn't physically hurt them, there's no doubt that their stress hormones are going up. So it's important that the other parts of their life are as stress-free as possible so that the snake can stay healthy and still tolerate this. So... I'd like to point out that this is just the beginning of like 200 Oh yeah, yeah, we're not going to make you watch the whole thing, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Jim is just getting started on his day. There are just shy of 200 snakes in this building that he'll be doing today. And it really wouldn't be possible for us to have this many um, and take care of them adequately without using some sort of efficient system for housing them. So this is the last one we're going to show you on the video. have any questions uh, that I haven't answered you can put them in the comments and we'll try to answer them for you. Four in two, 2016. Oh, 2016 so they are four years old. How do you know when to start them on extraction? Oh that's a good question we do get that frequently. Uh, we typically wait until snakes are about two years old to start extracting uh, it varies some depending on the species, but it's based on when that species can, would typically reach sexual maturity. Uh, we can extract from juveniles. Sometimes researchers actually request us to extract from juveniles, but uh, for most purposes, we're extracting from like average adults. So that typically for these guys starts when they're about two years old. All right, so you guys can also uh, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, and uh, subscribe. Thanks. Have a good day.